Good morning and welcome to the Black Pill Radio Show. I'm your host, Mr. Tyler, and today we are going to be discussing the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's message to America that he gave yesterday on July 4th, 2020. I have a wonderful panel with me. I'm going to have them introduce themselves and then we're going to jump right into the conversation. So I'm going to start with Mr. Hassan. Peace, peace, family. My name is Hassan Mayfield. I'm the founder and director of the Harlem Fund. The Harlem Fund is a grassroots organization dedicated to the development and the upliftment of all our underserved people within the community of New York and throughout the United States. Well, when we're talking about Minister Louis Farrakhan, first of all, I wanna give big, big respect to him for being our messenger for decades now, doing what he can to deliver the message to the people to help the people wake up. So let me go to Ms. Tamika next. Um, so my name is Tamika Anthony. I'm a forensic scientist and toxicologist. Um, I have a natural product line called Xanthine's All Natural Products, which is geared towards um, bringing more safe and non-toxic products into our um, communities. Um, I also run a camp called Camp Wakanda. It's a STEAM camp um, that uses science, technology, engineering, art, math, and entrepreneurship to um, teach black and brown children about their innate superpowers. Um, happy to be here today. Thank you very much. Happy to have you. Let's go to Mr. Shea. Hey, sir, family. My name is Ashe Karan. Um, I'm a spoken word artist. Um, I've also been um, in the community uh, with the nation and uh, also martial artists. Just really any positive uh, vibes or anything positive I can uh, bring to the community, that's what I'm all about. You know, because it's time for us to help us out. You know, nobody's going to come and save us. It's time for us to save ourselves. So that's that's what it's all about. And I'll thank you, uh, Brother Tyler, for having me on. Appreciate you. Thank you. Anytime, brother. I appreciate you as well. And last but not least, we're going to go to Monet the Artist. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Monet the Artist. Um, I want to thank Tyler, first and foremost, for allowing me on the platform. Um, I'm a songwriter, musician, entrepreneur. I'm from Connecticut. And I'm 27 years old. Thank you for the age shout out. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about the uh, Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan message to America, which was yesterday. He spoke for three hours and he touched on a lot of different things. Our broadcast today is going to be about an hour. So we obviously won't be able to cover everything that he spoke about, but we will cover some of the things that he touched on. Uh, when I listened to it, what I heard a lot from it was speaking about the coronavirus and the pandemic and the agendas and what's going on with all of that. So I want to touch on that first. I'm going to come to Mr. Hassan and you can go in any direction you want with it because he spoke in depth about the coronavirus. But when you heard him speak, um, what did you take from it? What was the message that he was giving to you as far as the coronavirus was concerned and how it affects the black community? Well, basically for me, it's all about us as a people, as a black people, brown people, bring, being aware because we always have, whether they're natural disasters, whether they're, where they're um, excuse me, whether they're controlled, created and manufactured disasters coming at us, this has been happening since time memorial for us. So what he was basically doing is just for me, putting people on point to remain on point that we have to always take care of ourselves, mind, body, and spirit. Once we continue, when we continue to make sure we're healthy, then these things that come along to attack us with the right knowledge and the right action, we're going to be able to hold ourselves down. I don't want to get far into it because like you said, it was a lot and it's a lot of us here and I love to hear other people speak. But the gist of the message for me is simply do the knowledge, know what you're dealing with, connect with the right people for the right resources, and make sure you take care of yourself personally so we can help others take care of themselves to combat anything and everything that comes our way. Or the rest of the stuff politically, I mean, I'll allow everybody else to start getting into it, and then we can start going in from that. But from the brother, that's what I took from it. Let's make sure we stay safe by staying healthy, keeping our minds right, keeping our spirits right, 
and utilizing the right resources and supporting each other and making sure we go with this coronavirus crisis that they have going on with us right now. Sounds good. Thank you for that. Ms. Tamika, what, what do you think about his message regarding the coronavirus and how it affects our people? Um, what I took from it and something I've been saying is like being very leery about the vaccine or vaccine that they um, are saying that they're working on. There are several um, scientists and groups of scientists and laboratories working on vaccines right now. Um, and they're putting it out there like that's going to be the only way for us to come out of this. Um, what I like is that he gave a great history of, you know, um, our people and how they've treated us when it comes to testing certain things, right? So, for example, bringing up the syphilis experiment is remi you're reminding us that, you know, it's us still trusting the same entity, right, that, that really has never had our back, you know? Um, and so when it comes to the vaccine, like as a scientist, I can tell you it takes maybe about 18 good months at least, you know what I'm saying, to really, really come up with a vaccine. Um, I'm one that doesn't vaccinate my kids, but as far as the science behind it, like it does take quite some time to do so. They have to test in various ways. And it's just a little bit alarming at the, the quick rate, right, that this is happening. Um, the only two ways for us to really, you know, um, come out of this is, you know, to be inoculated against this particular thing. And the only way that's going to happen is Yes, maybe through the vaccine, but at the end of the day, it's going to have to get worse before it gets better, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be have to be a lot of more people getting it and developing the antibodies for it to create a sort of herd immunity where, you know, it's no longer really a threat, where there's more of us inoculated against the vaccine than not. And so um, I agree with him. I would definitely caution, you know, any of us being so quick to like not just inject ourselves, but injecting our children. Cause that's going to be the new thing. Like your kids can't go back to school, right? If they don't have the vaccine, it's going to be, I could see that happening already. So just, you know, for those parents that, you know, like they need their kids to go to school so they could go to work. Like it's like a hard decision to make, but you know, I would definitely caution people against um, taking this vaccine. What I do like about what he said is if they do come out with a vaccine that we need to, you know, create our own group of scientists, right? Our own group of virologists to test this said vaccine so that we can come out as a, you know, like black scientists speaking to our black people saying, you know, we've seen the vaccine, we've tried, we tested it, and we did the things that we need to do to prove to you guys, our people, you know what I'm saying, that the vaccine is okay, which I don't see that happening anyway. But, um, you know, just having a group of people that we can trust that have the same credentials as these people creating the vaccine. And I myself would definitely not, you know, mind being a part of that, um, that group, you know, with my science background, but, um, I would definitely caution whatever vaccine they come out with, um, just keep in the back of your mind that these are the same people that did the syphilis experiment and had no problems doing that. And that was less than, was that like not that long ago, you know, so that's how I feel about that. You're, you're definitely right about the distress and also the trickery because your kids won't be able to go to school without the vaccine, like you stated. Um, if you work in a hospital, you won't be able to work in the hospital without the vaccine. If you teach in the schools, you won't be able to teach in the school without the vaccine, um, taking the vaccine. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's going to be tough. All right. So, Moneda Artist, we are coming to you. What do you, what do you think about Mr. F Mr. Uh, Farrakhan's message regarding the coronavirus? Um. Well, first and foremost, it was a powerful message. Um, I'll just have to piggyback off of uh, what Hassan and uh, Tamika also mentioned. Um, I just feel like we as a people, we have to govern ourselves accordingly um, and seeing what we're up against, um, that it's pretty much just, um, it's bigger. I feel like it's bigger than this virus. It's more so it's bigger than a race war. And it's really, time for us as a people to really come together and help each other in any way possible, um, with, whether it's not even on a financial standpoint, just spreading that knowledge to make sure that we're all woke and we're all on the same page and we're all in agreement and, uh, you know, what's about to, you know, take place. Um, as far as the vaccine goes, <clears throat> excuse me, I would definitely say that it's pressure it's going to be a lot of peer pressure on uh, parents, you know, because they want their children to go to school. Um, I know a couple parents who done snatched their kids out of school and started homeschooling them. So I would definitely say that, you know, this is just, it's trickery once again. Um, but it's just interesting that, you know, brown people are always used as the guinea pigs. 
um, you know, in that standpoint. But I would definitely say he was just uh, pretty much forewarning us to um, not take their medication, do not trust what they're saying. Um, if I had to say, I would definitely just say, you know, stick to natural, stick to herbs. And, um, you know, just making sure that your immune system is boosted, you know, and eating healthy, definitely eating healthy. Got you. Let me come to Brother Karan. Um, can you tell us what you think about Farrakhan's message regarding the coronavirus and the vaccines? Yeah, brother, I think that um, it's, it's definitely a good approach. And I feel like as a people, as a community, that's how we need to start moving as far as looking to ourselves and how we can help ourselves instead of looking for uh, government or for anyone else to come and help us. At the end of the day, we have skilled uh, practitioners, you know, we have uh, professionals in every field. So, you know, there's, there's nothing about us needing to wait for others. I think to a, to a great degree, we've been conditioned to wait for others to do for us what we can do for ourselves. So I just think it's great. And it's, it's just time for us to just rearrange the way we think as a people and just empower ourselves knowing that we have everything that it takes to to provide what we need for ourselves. Thank you, brother. So Mr. Hassan, he, he talked about, Mr. Farrakhan talked about um, not trusting the vaccine. Um, and he, he mentioned some things that took place in American history um, where we've been guinea pigs, we've been the lab rats, we were tested on certain things. A lot of people don't talk about what went on during slavery where our people who are enslaved were also being tested um, on different different uh, vaccines and different things like that. Um, he did mention Cuba. He mentioned Madagascar in terms of looking at some of the some of the medicines and some of the vaccinations that they're testing and looking into. Um, so while we're building our immune system and while we're taking herbs and doing different things like that, as Monet the artist said, um, and as Hassan said about you know health. Um, what do you think overall, though, about a vaccine for a virus? Because to my knowledge, I don't know any vaccines that work on viruses. You know, viruses are always going to be around um, and they may kill you. They may not. And it just depends on your health and, and how severe the virus is. But there aren't a lot of people dying in, in terms of the percentage that are being infected. Um, so do you even think a vaccine is necessary? And I'm going to throw that question to Mr. Hassan. I'm not a I'm not an anti-science type of guy. I'm actually a science type of guy. So I don't just discount science when when people are trying to bring it about for the development and the progress of us as a civilization, as a people. Vaccination, the the theory of it, as Tamika was saying, is simply taking taking a virus that's quote unquote dead and injecting it into our body so we can have some type of antibodies for it, right? That is what's the, the ability to boost up the immune system. Me personally, me personally, I very rarely get sick, if at all. I haven't had a, a cold or flu in years. I, I just don't even remember, right? And when I bring this up to people, I bring it up to my mom because around people that's sick, I don't get sick. Not to say that I'm like incapable of getting sick, but it just doesn't happen for me. My mother said, boy, you used to play in the dirt, you used to look for dirt. <laughs> she, she said, yo, when you was a kid, all you did was search for worms, look for ants and dig all in the dirt. So me being, ability me being able to think about that is like that's how we boost up our immune systems when we're young by exposing ourselves to these things when the baby is very young it gives the baby the ability to start creating a strong immune system i'm not real i'm i'm anti-vaccination the reason being not on theory alone about what vaccination is about but all of the added ingredients they use to create the vaccination. It's already proven dozens of dozens of chemicals that are harmful to the body that are toxic. They use it inside these vaccinations. And 
when you think about that, that is where the agenda becomes evil in my eyes. We look across. We look across the spectrum when they create foods. When they when they refine the foods, you see chemicals inside these food sources that are totally harmful to the body. What's the reason for it being there? When you look at soap products, excuse me. When you look at health products, you see these chemicals inside of these products that are totally harmful to the body. And the question is, why are they putting these chemicals inside these things that? absolutely do not need to be there so that's my reason for saying i'm totally against vaccination due to that particular reason simply because they are adding chemicals that is harmful to us if it was not if that was not so then scientifically artificially they would be doing what we do naturally when we allow our kids to play in the dirt so to speak when we just let them be them when they are young, we feed them maybe um, seafood and their bodies start developing these antibodies. So when they get older, they already been exposed to seafood and things of that nature. So when they enter their bloodstream and enter their body, they can deal with it. Keeping the kids away from all those things, like right now, people are hypersensitive about that. They don't want their kids to get dirty. They don't want their kids to eat this. They don't want their kids to eat that. And now we have like a, a, a kid that has a immune system that's weakened because it wasn't exposed to all these different things. So by a political stance, I'm against vaccinations. And that's the reason why, because of the toxic chemicals that they place inside. Theoretically, I think vaccinations can be a helpful tool if it was applied properly. And like Tamika was saying, we need our own scientists to have our own counsel to make those determinations for us. And we have scientists all over the world. Tamika is a scientist herself that we could say, okay, this is the vaccination they presented to us. Let's break this down. Let's see what's the chemical makeup of it. And we determine then whether or not it can be useful for those who, who may need a vaccination. Other than that, once again, she said the herd, the herd um, immunity, that's a real thing. And people are going to die behind that as well. But it's something that can ensure that the majority of the people would start developing this immunity to this virus that we have now plaguing us. So Excellent. that's my take on that. Excellent words, brother. And I agree with you 100 percent. Miss Tamika, I'm going to come to you to address what Mr. Hassan said. But I also want to add to that um, for the people who have weakened immune systems, um, mm -hmm. severely weakened immune systems. Um, it, how do we fix that? Right. Is that fixable by vaccines or not like what's your take on all of that i i agree it's, it's hard for me as a scientist because i believe in science right when it's used as a tool um properly um i've been in many situations where i've seen it used improperly and it you know it bothers me um i think that there's going to come a point where I, first of all i think it should be a choice like i'm not with somebody forcing me to take a vaccine because there are two ways to become inoculated you can either get the thing and develop the antibodies on your own, which I feel like should be my choice, or you can get the vaccine, right? For those people that um, that have the weakened immune system because they have you know, immune deficiencies for whatever reasons, then yeah, they should have the choice or maybe that shouldn't be like an option. And they probably will choose to get the vaccine and that's t totally fine. But um, I think we're gonna have to make a choice between our lifestyle, right? And, and, and the vaccine. When I say that, I mean, there are many ways to boost your immune system, right? Um, and I think as a people, we have strayed far away from health and wellness in our communities, right? Um, people wanna learn how to how to treat something rather than prevent it. It's like, all right, you're pre-diabetic and they keep doing the same thing over and over and now you're diabetic and you need insulin. So we're gonna have to make some choices on an individual level, a family level, and as a community as to what we're gonna do to um, inoculate ourselves. Because a lot of us say we don't want the vaccine and that's great, but yet you're out there, you know, eating fried foods and doing all these things. So you have to understand that it can't be both ways. If you're gonna choose not to be vaccinated, that's fine. Like parents that don't vaccinate their kids, that's your right. But what are you doing to, to support the immune system? And that's the conversations we're gonna start, we're gonna need to start having in our communities is like, you know, checking ourselves and saying like, we're not doing that great as far as on the natural, you know, um, in a natural place, taking care of ourselves. 
right? So now you don't want the vaccine, but you also don't want to stop eating fried chicken, right? That's not going to be, you know, that's going to be something that we're going to really have to be, you know, very diligent on when we're, we're making choices for ourselves and our families. Um, the thing with the virus is it hasn't been around that long. So it's like, you have to learn about it. There are people now that have gotten coronavirus, tested for the antibody positive and got it again. Like, why is that happening? That just lets you know that, you know, uh, maybe the, because when you become immune to something, that immunity may not last a long time, which is why a lot of vaccines have boosters, right? So sometimes the immunity might only be for 10 years, might only be for five years. The, the, this virus hasn't been around long enough for us to determine what that looks like. So we're going to need a vaccine every year, every five years, every 10 years, what? For me, I'd rather just take my chances in just getting the thing and allowing my body to decipher what it needs to decipher and moving from there. Right. Um, and just, just like Mr. Hassan said, it's like it's not just the, the vaccine, like the, the concept behind the vaccine, especially for those people that are immune deficient. Yes. Like give them the thing in the dead form so that their body can, you know, inoculate itself against it. But there are other things in vaccines. Right. You know, they use, you know, like fetal um, cells from aborted babies. They use, you know, bovine serum from, you know, from 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 animals. That's going to go against some people that have a certain religious lifestyle, like they don't eat, you know, animal products, things like that, right? But it's also about the manufacturers of the vaccine, right? That's who I care the most about and what their agenda is, because they're the ones putting things in it. And there really aren't that many, um, like, entities that are regulating and overseeing the people creating the vaccines. There are vaccine um, companies that Europe doesn't even use, that America does, because Europe for some reason, cares more about their people than America does. So it's like there's some vaccine companies that are currently being sued by other countries because they realize that they don't have the people's best interest at heart. So it's not only about developing the vaccine and figuring out what's going in it, but who's regulating the people that's actually creating the vaccines, you know, too. And then a lot of people don't know, like when you go to the doctor, there's usually like two fridges in the, in the, with vaccines, right? One fridge of vaccines is usually like the wholesale vaccines from the government. Those are for people that have low income, right? Those are for people that have, you know, maybe Medicaid or, you know, those low income insurances. And then there's another fridge for with vaccines of for people that have private insurances, right? What's the difference between those two? You know what I mean? It's the difference between going to Dollar Tree and getting something and going to Target and getting something, right? Like you're going to pay a dollar at Dollar Tree for the same thing, but why are you paying a dollar? Right. right. Why are you paying a dollar? Because something is wrong with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So why are they giving those people that have low income or, you know, um, have Medicaid? Why are they giving them a totally different vaccine? They say it's the same thing. But how could it be the same thing if it's held in two different locations? Right. And so who are people that are normally um, on Medicaid or, you know, um, have, you know, because of other structural racism, you know, going on? We already orchestrated to be in that category right, of people that have low income and people that have Medicaid, it's us, right? So that's a concern for me as well. So it's it's like, who's checking the people, right? Who's checking the people, putting the stuff in the vaccines, who's checking the people manufacturing the vaccines, and who's checking the people that's distributing the vaccines to various communities? And so all of these things would need to be, you know, um, determined um, by us, for us kind of thing, for me to even tell somebody, yeah, you know, you should get that vaccine whether they're immune compromised or not, right? So it's, it's a lot of different, you know, pieces to the puzzle. But to be quite honest, it goes back to, like, us stopping depending on other entities to tell us what to do. We know what to do. Like, we need to eat more fruits and vegetables. We need to cut the meat out, to be honest. We need to cut out all this other stuff and mm -hmm. really inoculate ourselves. Because at the end of the day, you could walk out tomorrow and somebody coughs on you, catch it. What's going to determine if you live or die is one, how, you know, how strong, you know, the virus is when it gets into your body, but how strong you already were when the virus got in there. You know, it's like a boxing match. You walk in the, you know, you go into the ring with somebody that's, you know, feel like you're going to knock them out. So which one are you going to be in the ring? Are you going to be the one that's the stronger fighter or are you going to be the one that's the weaker person? And that's going to determine who's going to walk out of that ring. If it's going to be Corona and you in a body bag, or you're going to walk out with the antibodies you need to keep it pushing. So we just have to really put the mirror up to ourselves and say, we got to take better care of ourselves. Excellent. That's how so I feel about that. Excellent. That leads me into my next thing. I want to come to Brother Karan. Farrakhan said, and I'm not quoting him, but kind of paraphrasing, forcing us to take the vaccine is a declaration of war. Um, what do you think about that comment? 
Um, yeah, I think that um, also he, one thing he did uh, was coupled it with the smallpox, and then he brought up the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, in those instances, a war was declared on those groups of people, and they were affected by the, uh, you know, the quote unquote treatment that they received. So, you know, like Sister Tamika was saying, like, you know, when you force me to do something, that's something totally different. You know, now basically you got to fight on your hands because I already know the history of how you guys have used uh, these diseases in the past and biological and chemical warfare in order to wipe out populations. And, you know, you have uh, Melinda Gates who's saying that black people are the first ones who's going to have to get the uh, vaccine because of underlying uh, diseases or whatnot. You know, they these people, they plan years in advance. They plan 20, 50 years in advance. You know, they're looking at their birth rate and they have uh, a zero of, I don't remember the exact count, but basically for every baby that's born, uh, someone dies. So they have like a zero birth uh, count. So basically they can see they're going to soon be the minority in this country. So they, you know, these people, they plot and they plan and they use other devices to, to kill and murder populations. If you look in that book, Murder by Injection, you can see how they would use us as guinea pigs in order to test these virus and disease on us and, and kill us in different ways. So, you know, when you're talking about war, you're talking about the preservation of life. When somebody uh, declares war on you, they're moving to get rid of you. And the only reason it's a war is because, you know, you're willing to fight back. You're, 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 you're not just gonna, you know, give up and, and lay there and just let them do what they have to do. You're gonna, you're the opposing force. So they're trying to vaccinate us. So it's up to us to fight back and not just allow them to do what they plan to us you know, like, you know, you, you, you're going in there taking a vaccine, knowing the history of these people and what they have done to us over the years, then, you know, in a sense, you're almost going in there committing suicide because you're putting your trust in the hands of your known enemy. You know, we know these people don't care about us. They could care less about what happens to us. You know, look at how we get murdered in the street. Look at what's, you know, the these things have been going on since we've been in this country. And our problem is we keep thinking that their hearts are going to change towards us, that their minds are going to change towards us. These people do not have our best interests in heart and they have proved it time and time and again. So if they give a vaccine, they're not going to give us a vaccine, hoping that we become healthier, hoping that we become stronger. They're going to give us a vaccine and try to implement their own strategies which is the population, which they've been planning that for quite a long time. So with that being said, yeah, it's, it's war. It's definitely a war. And it's up to us to fight back and to preserve our lives. Excellent, brother. When you talk about depopulation, um, we got to talk about the doctors who are killing us in the hospitals, which is something Farrakhan mentioned. And that's something that I had brought up on the last broadcast that we had, where there were a whole bunch of white doctors making all these internet videos saying that, it's not the virus that are killing people. It's the misdiagnosis, the mistreatment within mm -hmm. the hospitals that are killing these people. Um, so I'm going to bring that to Monet, the artist. Um, mm -hmm. I know you've been doing some research. You sent me some videos and stuff like that. We've been looking at that online. Um, what are your feelings about that as far as the depopulation plans and the doctors who doctors, white doctors who have made videos saying that they are killing patients in the hospitals during this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I mean, me personally, I mean, you know, I had my own experience um, with doctors um, and it's actually coming to a closing. I had a, a medical malpractice situation myself, so I definitely agree with that with doctors. Um, you know, it's all like a payday, basically misdiagnosing people and saying that they had COVID just to get extra funding, extra money. And that actually happened to uh, someone I know back here um, where I'm from. And um, they had diagnosed her with COVID and she didn't even have it. So, and 
to even piggyback on, you know, what all the other panelists have mentioned, um, I definitely agree uh, with everybody stated. And just to note, you know, as far as like um, what was mentioned, I, me personally, I would be against vaccination. I mean, just because of what happened to me uh, within the past two years of being injured, um, going to 69 appointments and seeing 16 doctors. Right now, I'm suing 16 doctors right now uh, for misdiagnosing me uh, with two, I was misdiagnosed twice uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis, um, Kyrie 1 malformation. They tried to take my brain fluid. Me to too. <laughs> <laughs> And it's again, it's it's um it's crazy. Um, I mean, and, and Tyler, I tell you, um, I had a emotional moment about it, but I stood strong with it because it was just something for them for a doctor to come out their mouth and say, "There's something about you. You're unique." And when you use that terminology, it stood out to me, and I said, "Well, wow. Why would that terminology be used towards me?" And I've been fighting with them for about two years. And the images that they were showing my mom and I were images of a 67 year old man. They mailed his MRI of his brain to my house. And um, I still have CD actually still, still to this day. And it was puzzling to me. And I said, wow, it's really, 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 you know, a biological warfare out here. This is really, really, um, this depopulation is very serious. And when I tell people this story, they're looking at me like I'm crazy, like, wow, like you, yeah, this is really happening. Um, I don't regret it happening to me. I look at it as it happened to me so I could speak on it um, and forewarn others. I looked at it as, you know, I had to allow this, this situation happen to me, not by mistake or on, it happened to me on purpose for me to be able to voice and really tell people to advocate when it comes to your health and knowing what, what somebody's trying to inject you with. Um, and like I said, me being also anemic as well. Um, I have low iron, but I take my iron medication and everything. And um, from this whole situation happening, they took like over 40 tubes of blood from me. So um, if I had to say, I would definitely say, you know, I would like to see more, you know, black doctors um, really step forth and um, really give us informative information as far as what we need to do uh, to make sure that we're in the right uh, position. Right now I have a black doctor, she's phenomenal. She's the one who actually saved my life, who actually told me um, that I didn't have multiple sclerosis. Um, they were trying to fight her to the T, um, but it didn't work out that way. It ended up, the truth ended up being exposed anyhow. So. Um, that's pretty much my my take on that. Um, as far as with doctors and stuff like that, I don't really trust doctors after my experience. Um, so that's why I just take the healthy route. Um, I juice a lot, smoothies, um, jog and walk, whatever you want to call it. I do a lot, a lot of that, and um, that's my way of just you know staying healthy and maintained, maintaining, you know, both my mind, body, and soul. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. I know that's personal. And um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're here with us because it's real. So when you talk about that biological warfare, uh, Farrakhan spoke about that. When you talk mm -hmm. about the the other type of warfare where we have police out there killing us, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Farrakhan spoke about that as well. Um, you know, I follow somebody, Mr. Tariq Nasheed, and he talked about in Chicago, every weekend is like 80 shootings, 90 shootings. He said, watch this weekend, especially that it's 4th of July weekend. When you look at the numbers coming from Chicago this weekend, it's probably going to be over 100 people shot. But he doesn't believe, and his theory is those are not black people shooting and killing each other. He thinks it's law enforcement and people connected to law enforcement that come into Chicago and do what they do during the course of a weekend and then go back to the suburbs or wherever they came from. Um, and Mr. Farrakhan spoke about that, the jump out boys. Right? You're jumping out your vehicles, committing these crimes, and then you jump back into your vehicles and you go home. He said mm -hmm. the next time you jump out, you're not going to be able to jump back in because we're not going to take it anymore. So I do want to move this to Mr. Hassan for this next question. When we talk about the police killing us, um, what Mr. Farrakhan said is in their nature, and that's part of the warfare against black people. Um, what are your thoughts on that? He's absolutely correct. We understand the history of the police and, you know, where the organization derived from. We, we understand the history of this country, how this country became as, quote unquote, powerful as it has. It's through, you know, our labor as people. 
being used for work. Mm -hmm. Having slaves in the field to work, they needed to control these slaves. Mm -hmm. So when they controlled our ancestors by having quote unquote supervisors, these people were overseers that made sure they did the work while they were in the field. And if they tried to run, these people ran them down and did what they did to them. As mm -hmm. time moved on, we see that started transforming or evolving into these different entities that became more and more official as slavery started to slowly, slowly evolve. The police force was simply an organization that was used by the quote unquote financial masters to protect their property. That's the history of the police. So on one end, we have we have the police being made to protect the property of the masters in the event of theft, fire, vandalism, destruction, so forth and so on. On the other end, we have the same idea of property ownership, us being black slaves, we looked at as property. So when that started to evolve, now it was make sure the black people stay in their place. So once we get relegated and segregated to these environments that they call ghettos, the police have the duty now to keep us in place. And they do that through terrorist tactics. They do that through the use of fear. They do that through so-called policing. And that's to make sure we don't spill out into the more wealthier environments and threaten their property and threaten their lives. This is my view on it. I've had de dealings with the police ever since I was walking outside my door as a little kid. And thankfully, my father, he always placed inside me that consciousness that the police is not here to help us. If you all you have to do is just observe it and you see on a general level, not particular police who feel like it's their responsibility to quote unquote help the community. But we talk about generally speaking, the police force is there, they're patrolling and they simply making sure things don't get out of hand. They allow things to happen and make sure things don't quote unquote get out of hand. They don't protect us. They don't quote unquote fight crime. They just did a clean up. So we see this day by day. Now, when we have these situations begin to arise where it becomes exacerbated that there's a there's a there's a issue going on that's controversial the police are like a button is pressed and we start seeing more of the police actions in which they are killing our people because that haven't stopped since it's, since the beginning and it hasn't stopped but every now and then it flares up like we're seeing now it seems to be flaring up i didn't take in the, the numbers recently to see just how much more it's happening but we see that the police are being used as a mechanism to keep us in line and to kill us for particular political agendas and like i said when things start happening and the people start becoming aware or conscious of one thing then we see more police activity with killing our people and another as if it's an attempt to throw us off to scare us, to keep us more within ourselves and not be um, not be more open and expressive in the way that we carry ourselves, what I like to say spiritually, like being feeling free, feeling like we are independent, feeling like we are able to just be ourselves. They try to stamp down that, that spirit to keep us fear, fearful and terrified. So I wholeheartedly agree. I had a personal experience with the police in which I was confined due to shooting a cop when I was a, just a teenager because they would they would talk they would terrorize us they would torture us they would come through our community whether guys were selling drugs or guys were just walking down the street they'll jump out and they'll make the excuses and I was just telling my guys when I was when we were kids we're not just going to accept this anymore you know and what happened 
I got into a situation while I was living my crime life where the police, they were out for me and they attempted to try to kill me and we got into a shootout. And ultimately I shot the police and I wound up get, being confined for it. So my, my, my views is based on just general observation and my personal experiences that yes, indeed, the police is a tool, they're a machine used for these purposes. Terrorize, keep in check, keep the quote unquote animals in check to avoid spillage into our society and to kill, pick, pick them off when possible. So that's my take on that, brother. And thank you for sharing. Um, so we talk about, you know, we're making that transition from bio warfare to actual on the ground warfare. Um, I'm not quoting Far Mr. Farrakhan, but he did speak about they lie and they murder within and it's within their nature. The rep police reports have lies in them. They are murdering our black people. All right. So he, he said it's within their nature to murder us. So, Brother Quran, um, can you expound on that a little bit, please? Um, sure, man. I think that if we look at the history of uh, these people, man, like look at our history of slavery is written in blood. You know, if it's the, a book called um, uh, Return to the Indies by, uh, by Bartolome de las Casas, and he chronicles what Columbus mm. and all of them did when they came to Hispaniola. Uh, you know, which is now known as Haiti and Cuba now. They came and they, they you know, and it's a graphic, um, it has the graphic details, you know, it talks about how they would grab the babies and dash their head against the rocks. They would uh, set up, uh, you know, stations to burn the bodies of the victims. They would hang them uh, from, from these wood planks and then they would burn the bodies they would cut off the limbs of, of the natives and they would wear the limbs around their body parts like chains. You know, this, this is the behavior that led to the founding of this country that we live in right here. And these activities have been going on ever since we've been here. They've been a little more uh, covert now but they've, they're, they're still going on from the lynching, from the burning. So these are just modern day lynchings, you know? So instead of them just being outside in KKK gear, now they, they may have on, uh, you know, they may be in the judicial system now. Now they may be in the, the police precincts now. Instead of being outright blatant, now they're carrying their stuff out on the higher level. They're in, uh, you know, like I said, the chemical and biological warfare. So they're not just out front killing you. They're killing us through our food. They're killing us through the water. They're killing us in different ways now. Nothing has changed. You know, so it's really up to us to wisen up and smarten up and understand that we have to look out for ourselves. Look at what happened in Flint, Michigan with the water crisis and what was going on out there. You know, they got exposed, but how many more Flint, Michigans exist in this country right now? How many more of us are being victimized and don't even know it? So I think that it's really time for us to wake up and understand that we're dealing with a real enemy who doesn't want to see us thrive, who doesn't want to see us be successful. We have to come together as a people and, and do what's needed for ourselves if we're going to make it. Um, I want to bring this to Tamika. Um, when I watched the news and I was out there marching a few times, I, I saw that we had some allies who were not black. Um, and then I saw how the police treated them as well. Um, so the police were beating them, arresting them and harming them, too. Um, so what does that say about the police and how they police citizens that anybody who stands along along the side sides of uh, black people, they can get it, too, because we see it on TV that they are getting it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as far as as far as my thoughts on that, since since the abolitionist movement and before the abolitionist movement, we had allies who were non-black right and that didn't change we still have allies who are non-black i have some allies who are non-black as well and the 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 system they do have that feeling 
if you are a white person and you are assisting black people in their liberation or their independence, their development, their growth, then the white power structure deem you a traitor. Just like the opposite. If we see a black person, I was gonna go into that with the police. The police officer that I had my encounter with, he was black. There is when it comes to when it comes to white supremacy racism, the they just happen to be white. Everyone, everything is simply fodder, tools to be used to maintain their control, their domination over all things on this planet and beyond. That's their mindset. So they use racism as a tool to keep people divisive. They keep people, oh, I don't want to deal with white people, or I don't want to deal with black people. It's it's quote unquote manufactured. And when we when we have a situation where a white person understands that what's being done is evil, it's immoral, it's unjust. And if they choose to stand on the side of justice, then they use that as a measure of showing treachery for white people. So this is why we have people who are ignorant saying, oh, why are you standing with them? And the police in this case is saying, oh, you want to help them? I represent the dominant power structure. If you're fighting the power structure, it does not matter what color you are. You are a threat to what we are about. And so there's multiple things going on and it's concentric circles within circles where these agendas are all coming into, you know, they're coming mm-hmm. into contact with each other. And so that's why we have to stay aware on so many levels. Because what we were just discussing, what I was just discussing right now is class warfare as well as race warfare. And when those two things intersect, people become confused. So that's why we have our people who rightfully so say, I don't want to deal with no white people mm-hmm. when it comes to me fighting for my freedom because white people are inherently evil. I understand that. I can see where they are coming from with that. I've experienced the whole mentality of that. But then when it comes to dealing with the larger issue, which is the haves versus the have nots and that doesn't have anything to do with race it just so happened these people who are dominating they are white then that that creates a cognitive dissonance inside the minds mm-hmm. of people who are straight pro-black and anti-white because then now they see a white guy who's saying i got pennies in my pocket just like you brother i gotta feed my daughter just like you brother who got the money Let's look up and we see these people got the money. So let's come together and let's take them down because they keeping us all fucked up. It it throws people off because whoever is willing to be your ally, if they are true and that that takes a test, you know, what I mean, to determine if they are true in their actions. But if they are true in their actions, then they are to be embraced so they can help fight this war. You know, what I mean, it's just that we have so much going on it's hard like malcolm x once said if it's a pit of snakes i'm not going to try to determine which one is poisonous you know what i'm saying so we have to stay we have to keep conscious of that but at the same time we can't allow that to forsake those who may be truly with us when it comes to our fight and let me say one more thing to that i was just out in la in bel-air I'm at I'm in I'm in LA at the top of the at the top of the hierarchy socially. I'm in Bel Air fighting against white supremacy, fighting against injustice. And I have nothing but white people, whether they doing it from guilt or whether they doing it because they feel genuinely compassionate and want to fight for social justice. They're fighting. And so with that being the case, I don't care if you feed in me because you have guilt to feed me or you feed me because you're as compassionate as Mother mm-hmm. Teresa. If I'm hungry and you're helping me eat, thank you. You know what I'm saying? So 
I just want to point that out, that we just have to be really discerning and circumspect so we don't get infiltrated and have our bottom come down from, uh, you know, come down from within because we embrace another people. But we still have to take what we can if we able to determine whether or not it can be useful for us or not. That's what I wanted to say today. Excellent. So I want to switch this around a little bit because we are about to hit the hour mark. I do want to come to Tamika first. Um, Mr. Farrakhan talked about repenting. He talked about looking at your record, right? Looking within mm -hmm. yourself and seeing how you can fix yourself, how you can address your sins, because we all sin. Um, mm -hmm. So when we speak about repentance and, and how that relates to the struggle and the movement, um, what are your thoughts on that? And that's for Tamika. Um, I don't subscribe to any type of religious space, but I think we all as black you know, and brown people, we are spiritual people, whether we like to um, address it or not. And um, the universe is always going to be in a state of balance. Um, and I think part of his message, what I received from it is, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, right? And it's a lot of fingers that we can point and blame and this and that, but everything really starts with self. Um, when I think about everything that's happening, I think about you know mother nature being upset about a lot of things that we have done to disgrace the space that we've been blessed with, meaning the earth. And um, I think it's a time of atonement, right? I think it's by no coincidence that we are all forced to be inside. What does that mean? That means that we are forced to be with self, right? And I feel like when we come out of this, whatever this is and however long it takes, we should be coming out better than we went in. And whatever that means for you, it could mean that you need to atone for some shit. It could mean that, you know, you need to um, develop a new skill set to be a better part of the fight that we, um, we are embarking on that we're currently in. It means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But um, on a strictly spiritual space, it's like in every every religion, it, there is some speaking of an atonement and, you know, um, the stuff that he was speaking about. And I think on a spiritual level, it's just like for me, like everything is always in balance. And in order to, to anytime the, the earth or anytime the universe has to go through something, it always starts with a space of chaos. And in science, we call it entropy. And so entropy is needed for order. So chaos is needed for order, right? And right now we're in a state of chaos. I don't think anyone can, you know, um, disagree with that. But it's about being still within the chaos so that when it's, you know, over and you go back out there and when going back out there, that's kind of like metaphorical, whatever that means for you, that you are out there better than you went in because we were in a state of imbalance prior to coronavirus. I think coronavirus did not create anything it just kind of unearthed and unveiled what we were already um, doing which was not all wonderful things so i think yeah this is a time for you to really think about your own life and be in tune with yourself and say like how am i helping anything whatever whatever your cause is how am i how am i being a a positive asset to myself my family my community etc and we speak about you know all these big changes um but a lot of this change starts with self like you can't go out there and fight a war if you didn't fix the battle in your household. You know what I mean? Or the battle within yourself. And I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to really start focusing on that so that we can be an asset because we're going to need, like um, Hassan said, we're going to need all the help that we can get. And um, I'm not really all that big on always including the others in our fight because, you know, now we got to watch our back even when they're in the space. But um, there's enough of us to affect change. And um, I think this is just the perfect time for us to think about what's that change that we need to create, not just for us, but for the future generations of our children and start in that chain within self. And so I, I don't know what his intention was uh, when he said that, but that's how I received it, right? That this is a time for atonement to figure out, you know, what we weren't doing right prior. And now it's like a before Corona, after Corona kind of thing. So what you were doing before and how you can make your after different and better than the before. Before Corona, after Corona. Excellent. Uh, this is a meme I had posted. Um, don't come out of quarantine bitter, come out of quarantine better. Better. Right? That's right. So we, we definitely want to look at our sins because I've sinned. We all sin. We all deal with stuff, you know, that we're all going through on a constant basis. Um, we do question ourselves. Um, but but how do we still make ourselves better and valuable and an asset to the struggle that we're dealing with? And, and that's like the question. So I want to go to Monet, the artist. Um, when we talk about repentance and forgiveness, 
I'm throwing forgiveness in there. But we talk about <laughs> repentance, right? It's going to come to a point where we're going to have to start forgiving too. When we talk about repentance, though, um, and looking at our own record, what does that mean to you? Um, For me, I feel like um, just looking back and reflecting on everything that you've done thus far. Um, and you just have to reset, um, reset your mind. And just you have to do, um, I call it a mental detox. And thus far, that's what this quarantine has been for me, just a mental detox in spite of everything that has happened with, with me. Um, I just took the time to find out what, what are my gifts, my other gifts, my other talents, uh, what can I bring forth that'll be um, beneficial, not just for myself, but for just brown people, period. Um, so I look at that as, you know, repenting, just giving time to reflect and um, just to forgive on a lot of things, whether, you know, it's something small, you know, something big um, and just, you know, um, staying positive in any situation. And that's one time and staying patient as well. Um, and that's an another thing that, you know, I took into consideration just this entire time, just being able to um just reflect and look at a lot of things and being able to move forward. So I think if we can focus on like the future and what's ahead um, and get out of the past, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll be at a better standing. Excellent. And I'm going to come to brother Karan. Um, I can forgive you. Right. But I still don't want to take an ass whooping from you. Right. So this <laughs> two different things, right? So while we in the state of quarantine, I think we came out of quarantine prematurely. And as soon as we came out of quarantine, it was in the midst of protest, rebellion, uprising, right? So, you know, going forward where it's going to be a hot summer, we say this every year, right? It's going to be a hot summer. It really looks like it's going to be a hot summer. Um, what message do you have to our people in terms of dealing with um, self-reflection, but at the same time, pushing forward for our freedom? I mean, honestly, I would just say, number one, be patient with yourself because, you know, sometimes we, uh, we want to rush our progress, but it's going to take a it's going to take a while. You know, it took us 400 years to get here. It's going to take a lot longer for us to, you know, get out of this. So I would say, you know, just reflect on the good, the bad, the ugly. Don't don't, uh, you know, over don't paint a picture of yourself that that's not real. Like take a raw look in the mirror of what you are doing, what you're not doing and, and go from there, you know? And, and I think since Tamika summed it up perfectly, man, this is, it's before Corona, after Corona. So if you have all of this time, it's up to you to use this time for your benefit. One mm -hmm. thing I heard the minister say before, he said to those who are doing time in prison, he said, don't serve time, let time serve you. So you want to take advantage of this opportunity because we don't know when we'll ever get this amount of time to focus on ourselves again. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really like that, uh, that caterpillar that goes into that cocoon for a minute. You know, it, it takes some time. It's a process, but ultimately it comes out in a more beautiful form. So, you know, just, just you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful and we just got to use the time to our benefit, you know. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. You have the last word. When we talk about repentance, but still moving forward in our struggle for independence and freedom, um, what advice would you have for our people? Well, we got to we got to atone. Like to me, I'm not religious, but I'm highly spiritual. And one of one of my one of my spiritual principles is atonement. Atonement means coming back together as one. So repenting for me is coming to my brother and sister and saying all the stuff that i'm responsible for that hurt us as a people i want forgiveness for that so i'm doing my part to show that i deserve forgiveness for that and that's creating rebuilding our village concepts throughout this united states throughout the world so we can all come in together and see each other as one throughout the pan-african scope you know what I mean? So in our community, what we're doing, we are repenting. We're going to the community. We're going to the our neighbors, our elders, and we're saying, I recognize you as a well of wisdom. I recognize you as being honorable, have, deserving this respect. What can we do to make sure 
we give you the respect and the honor that you deserve? What can we do to reinstill faith in you for us as a younger person to the older person? To the younger people, we go to them saying, I respect you as being a young person coming up and please forgive me for not doing my part in protecting you and holding you down how we supposed to. So you, so because, because this is the reason why you are afraid to play in the park. This is the reason why you are dying and we're not doing anything about it. So I apologize for that. So this is what our actions do. You know what I'm saying we are seeking that repentance in a practical way on a, on a, on a truly social level and that type of manner to rebuild our communities, to create our families extended community is family. We one and one, you know what I'm saying? So that's what it is for me. We are doing that on the ground by dealing with our people socially, politically, and economically, how we come back together, showing each other that spiritual side and not being hardened by the all of the tough things that we're going through on a day-to-day -day level. So it's about opening up ourselves and letting the people see our vulnerabilities and taking that and using that as a strength instead of a weakness, trying to hide our vulnerabilities, but showing them and saying, this is what I'm, I'm this is what hurts me. This is what, this is what affects me. I know it affects you too. Let's come together so we can develop our strength with this. That's strength to be able to do that. And that's what we have to do as people instead of, at, in, in my community, especially with the elements that I'm dealing with, instead of always putting up this facade and wearing the mask that I'm good, I don't need nobody. You know what I'm saying? And having this I, me, mine mentality as opposed to us, we, ours. You know what I mean? That's where that's stemming from. It's stemming from us hiding the traumas and hiding those fears because we're not getting our hand, the hands are not being extended to us in a compassionate way. So that's how we are repenting on my side by doing that to the other members in our community. Outstanding, guys. Thank you for the advice. I think to wrap that up, we definitely need to repent. We need to forgive ourselves. We need to forgive each other. And we do need to practice restorative justices policies within our own community because putting us in the, the dominant society's justice system clearly isn't going to work for us. Mm -hmm. um, we need to find alternative methods to that. Um, and we need to be a little bit more lenient on ourselves and on each other and on a community because we have a lot of struggles that cause us to do a lot of things that are not within our nature. Um, so to those who I, I may have offended, I apologize to you as well. Um, and hopefully you can forgive me as I journey to forgive myself because that's what it's about. And we need to kind of mm -hmm. heal and then move forward as a community as we still struggle within this country and globally for our freedom and our self-esteem and our dignity and, and justice, right, and equality. Um, we still want them to cut the check because reparations is long overdue. So we are still fighting for that. And, and we forgive you and we can hold hands, but we still want you to cut the check. So let's be clear about that. Guys, I thank you for joining the panel. Um, this this has been really enlightening. Uh, I think we touched on three things out of the many, many things the Honorable Lewis, Minister Louis Farrakhan spoke about yesterday. And um, I look forward to having you guys on the broadcast again. And so then stay safe. Um, be faithful, and I will talk to you guys soon. Peace.